I love Christmas. Any other Christmas fanatics out there? Come on, Christmas fanatics. I love the gifts. I love the food. How many food fans out there? My goodness, the cookies, all the above. I love the once a year conversations with family members that you're so glad you only have to see once a year. I love Christmas. Christmas is special. But I think perhaps for me, Christmas starts when you begin to see the lights. Right? The lights. I love the lights. Do we have the lights here? I love it when you, you begin to see the lights come out of houses and get decorated in neighborhoods and your kids beg you and ask to put lights on your house and you get to go walk the Pebble Creek neighborhood and see all the ro lights in Rockland. You drive around neighborhoods and every once in a while you'll find a gem of a house like this. Do we have that house? Every once in a while. That's artistry, friends. You know that person don't care about no one. I love that. You see, it was this small little laboratory in Menlo Park, New Jersey, that Thomas Alva Edison created the first incandescent light. See, this little invention with many failures would be something that would change the entire world. It began by lighting homes, followed by villages, followed by cities. And now our entire life revolves around this small little electric light. It powers everything, this artificial man-made light. So much so, our dependency is so great, we don't know what to do when the lights go out. Come on, everybody. When the power goes out, we don't know what to do. It was a normal night in L.A., if any night is normal in L.A. And 911 operators checked into work, and they got word that an earthquake was about to hit, and then it hits and strikes L.A. And so they prepare for the normal 911 calls that they would regularly hear. You know, maybe small injuries, structural damage, maybe even a fire. They were not prepared to receive the phone calls they would soon receive after. As they got word, the lights went out over all of L.A. The person calls and says, there is a war breaking out in Los Angeles. The sky is on fire. Another person calls, there is bombs going off in the sky. Please send help. Send the military. Finally, someone says, aliens are invading Los Angeles. This is not a movie. Call the president. So as all these phone calls happen, they continue up until the sun rises. And then they realized the reason people were calling is this is the first time many L.A. residents saw the stars. You see, these natural incandescent lights create what we call light pollution, these artificial lights. And when the lights over L.A. went out, one artist made a rendition. This is what they saw. See, we are designed to be drawn to natural light, not these artificial lights. And see, these last two years, the lights went out in many of our lives. We would all agree these last two years have probably been the hardest seasons of your life. The lights went out in your business. The lights went out on your savings account. The lights went out in our schools. The lights went out on people's health. Lights went out on people's marriages. And all the enemy would want you to believe is that there's no hope. There's no future. Your promise ahead is a long, cold, dark winter road. In the 8th century BC, a young prophet named Isaiah looked at the condition of his nation, much like ours. He saw the Assyrian oppressor, and he cried out to Yahweh, and Yahweh gave him a message to declare that is the same message that Yahweh declares to us today. The people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. The same message that he gave him nearly 3,000 years ago applies to us today. Some scholars translate this passage in the crude Hebrew. It says this, dwellers in a land as dark as death. We all recognize what our nation is now becoming. In this post-Christian era, if we actually had one to begin with. But as we look at the condition of our nation, that message of light still applies to us today. And what we have to understand is this, is that Yahweh is revealing his light, and it's the only light that can lead you out of the darkness that you're living in, and that light is Jesus. 
Only Jesus can lead you from the oppressor. Only Jesus can lead you from the spirit of death. Only Jesus can set you free from the addiction you turn to in the dark that no one else sees. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The light Jesus was referring to was not the light that Edison created in that laboratory. No, this is a light that's purer than any star, than any sun, or any fire you have set your eyes on. This is a pure, true, real light. And what we have to understand is that Jesus was not just updating his Facebook page. He was declaring he is God. Now, secular philosophers would want you to say that we as modern Christians are putting words in Jesus' mouth. Jesus was never implying he was God. He was just communicating that he's an enlightened one like Gandhi, like Buddha, like the Dalai Lama. Here's the reality. They're taking words out of Jesus' mouth. What we have to understand is this. In that culture that we are so far removed from, Jesus isn't making a casual announcement. He's declaring that he is God. Only Yahweh was referred to the light. And a song that was often sung at that time went like this, Psalm 27, 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? You see, this concept of darkness in life, the light, this metaphor is so common, especially in church world, we lose the potency and power that concept actually carries. See, the things we become overly familiar with are often the keys to our victory. And here's what we have to understand, is you can acknowledge Jesus is the light, you can believe in the light, it doesn't mean you're living in it. You can believe he's the light of the world, but you're still living in darkness. See, our concept of Jesus in our modern secular society is so small. He's not just an enlightened one. When you type in Jesus on a Google image search, these are the images you get up. Jesus of the burning heart. Jesus holding a cute little baby lamb. What's another one? Jesus, hashtag blessed. As sweet as these are, these will not lead you out of the darkness you're living in. As if this is your only concept of who Jesus is, some sweet man holding a lamb, that farmer will not rescue you from your addiction. That sweet little shepherd won't help heal your marriage. If that's your only concept of who Jesus is, if that's how you only envision him, it's like Hulk said to Loki in Avengers 1, puny God. If that's your only concept of who he is, it cannot rescue you from the darkness you're living in. We have to understand this. Jesus may have came in a manger. He left a conquering king. He may have came in weak and feet. We need to wake up, church. Come on, this is Christmas. He may have came in feeble clothes. He now wears a robe dipped in the blood of the lamb. This is a big deal. He stands and roars as the lion of the tribe of Judah. You don't mess with this king. As Kanye said it best, Jesus is king. We have to understand that at Christmas time, it's not about casual gifts and bad fruitcake and eggnog. This is about the king of the universe taking on your broken form to fix and restore what you could not. We have to understand that Jesus has called us and sent us as his missionaries, as his emissaries, as his representatives of light in a dark world. Isaiah chapter 9 is appropriately titled, the righteous reign of the coming king. 
We focus on that key phrase, unto us a son is born. Let me tell you, there's a whole lot more in Isaiah 9 than that. It's a beautiful passage. You'll hear it read many times. But here's something that many don't know. We now in modern history would say this is Isaiah pointing to Jesus. Most Jewish scholars believe that was fulfilled in Isaiah's day. Did you know that? They actually don't believe it's Jesus at all. And we're going to make a case real quick to prove how we believe it actually is. See, in Isaiah 9, they believe that this is the coronation of a new king. Here's what scholars write. Scholars have seen the poem as part of a coronation ritual for a particular king of Judah named Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a righteous king. He was a good man. He came in under a corrupt king, his father, and then changed the way the nation would go and got rid of most of the idols. Now, upon this, this song was sung, and as Hezekiah's reputation and his power grew, people believed he would fulfill this promise and set Israel free from their captor, from their oppressor. Here's the problem. Hezekiah became so proud of what he had built, Babylon sent messengers, and he invites them into the temple courts, he invites them into the treasury, and he brags about all he accomplished. Isaiah then confronts him on this and says, who is with you? Oh, the Babylonian kingdom. They sent me glad tidings. He said, what did you show them? What do you mean? What did you show them? Everything. Isaiah then gives him a dreaded word. He said, foolish king, you've showed them the treasuries of your God. You've showed them all that Yahweh has done. You will now lead your people back into captivity. It will no longer be Assyria. It will be Babylon. Here's what's tragic about this story. Hezekiah often had a reputation of repentance. But at that moment, he understood this. And it says his heart was glad because he recognized that the prophecy would not be fulfilled in his day. He said, at least in my life, I'll have safety, peace, and security. That's not a righteous king. That's a selfish son. And he turns this down, and Hezekiah's reign ends with a very chilling phrase in 2 Chronicles. And his heart was proud, and the people would soon be captured, captured by the nation of Babylon. See, we would contest that this is not fulfilled by one man. It needed God in flesh to fulfill the requirements of this passage. See, Isaiah is a unique prophet. Many don't know. Passages we skip over. Isaiah was so serious about his job, he even walked around naked for three years. Check out Isaiah 19 and 20. Isaiah was a bold prophet that was willing to do whatever Yahweh told him. He's kind of like one of those relatives at the dinner table or grabs a speech at a wedding that starts to say things that you don't understand. You know what I'm talking about? So he starts off this passage, and we all start it in Isaiah 9, 2, but he begins with a very rare and weird geography lesson. He says this, Isaiah 9, verse 1. In the former time, he brought contempt to the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, the Galilee of nations. This is strange. It really didn't apply to the time and the context of when Isaiah wrote See, here's something we have to understand, is when you read the Gospels, everything those Gospel writers were writing was highly intentional. Pay attention. Pay attention to the cities. Pay attention to the names. Pay attention to the time frames and how they write. And in Matthew chapter 4, we notice something unique take place. Verse 12. Now, when Jesus had heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. Sound familiar? So that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Those who lived in a land of great darkness have seen a great light. 
We understand that Jesus is the coming light. We understand that he fulfilled these promises. But what he does afterwards is what matters most. Matthew 4 verse 17. And Jesus declared, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. The light of the world reveals the darkness you're living in. And you're the one that chooses whether or not you get out of it. We can sing about Jesus all we want. Present all the gifts we want. We can tell the story of the wise men. But if you don't give your life to him, you're not wise, you're foolish. Do all the right things, say all the right words. You can believe in the light. It doesn't mean you're living in it. It requires repentance. And Jesus fulfilled what Hezekiah failed to do. He entered the dark place. Took on sin to set you free. Of that which you're bound by. Isaiah 9, 6 says this. For a child has been born for us. A son has been given to us. Literally means the authority. The government rests upon his shoulders. This is what I find odd. Why would Isaiah write these characteristics about a carnal human king. His name will be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually and there shall be endless peace. He is inviting himself in your life and in Christmas as we celebrate these 25 days from December 1 to the 25th but he's after every other day in your life as well. And what we have to understand is the one you're turning to is not a casual counselor. He's not some skilled therapist with a few pieces of paper on his wall. He's a wonderful counselor that is a mighty God. And the peace you are longing for is the invitation he offers you today. I've talked to many therapists, for me as well, but also talked to therapists. Right, Mike? There we go. The rate of suicide and depression these last two years is the greatest in our nation's history. The casual therapist is booked out four to six months at this moment. People are longing for peace. They're longing. We're living in not even ambient anxiety anymore. The whole state of the nation is anxious. And only Jesus is the solution. Not what president you hope is in office. Will you surrender your life to the only one with the solution? I don't know. But I can tell you I have. Only this king can get you out of the marriage pit that you've been dug in. Or the broken promises and covenant you live in. He comes to provide a way. He says, will you allow me to be Lord, Savior, and King? See, it's from this position. And when we understand the characteristics of Jesus. When we understand his goodness, his mercy. He offers us a promise in verse 4. For the yoke of their burden, the bar across their shoulder, the rod of the oppressor, you have broken as in the day of Midian. For all the boots of the trampling warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. Because of the authority that he carries, that little word, domination, is the word dominus in Latin. Because of this, he can break that yoke you've been living in that you've found no solution for. This is what he says. Many of you here are wounded. Many of you here have been betrayed. He says he takes those bandages. He takes those rags that were used for wounds. And he creates a bonfire that you'll be warmed in. And can warm others with. Only Jesus can remove all the wounds. All the bloody bandages. All the hurts. And create light in the middle of your camp. This is the invitation. This is why we celebrate Christmas. For unto us a son is born. 
unto us a son is given, and the government is upon his shoulders. Jesus comes as the reason for the season to give you an invitation into relationship and repentance. I'm here today to tell you it's the only path forward. Don't continue to live in the darkness that the enemy wants you to live in, has convinced you is actually safer to be in. Will you surrender your life to him? Will you hand over your allegiance from yourself and say, Jesus, come and be my king? As we close today, Matthew chapter 11 in the message says it beautifully. This is Jesus' invitation. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to make a real rest. Take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. You need to know that today. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Let's stand together and let's pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you that in this Christmas time, we get to have all the festivities, all the fun, all the food. But Jesus, we choose this day to declare you are the righteous king. You're the one we set our eyes on. You're the one we surrender our hearts to. With every eye closed, you're in a place today and you say, you know, I need to make things right with God. You may have been taken here by a family member and are glad it's over. Here's the deal. Jesus isn't done with you yet. Right now with your eyes closed, you're saying, you know what, I need to make a decision. I need to make things right with God. I'm one of those that maybe attend once or twice a year. But today I need to get my life right. Not so you get out of, get out of jail free card or get out of hell free card. This is about a relationship that Jesus is inviting you into and freedom he is promising. If that's you, lift your hand up right now. Holy Spirit, we declare, I see you. We declare, Jesus, that you would come and encounter our brothers and sisters. That you would show them the love, life, and light that only Jesus can bring. Right now, in your own words, just begin to pray a prayer to him. Saying, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Jesus, I give my life to you. Lord, would you become my Lord and Savior, not by name only, but by my life that I'm surrendering over. Secondly, you're here today and you identify there are things that have been owning your life, that have been overwhelming you. And you say, you know what, I need Jesus to set me free from the anxiety, from the depression, from the worry I've been carrying. If that's you, just lift your hand up if that's you right now. Jesus, we declare that you are King. We declare that you are Lord. Holy Spirit, break the yoke of the oppressor now in Jesus' name. We say no more despair, no more worry, no more anxiousness, no more panic attacks. We declare in Jesus' name for freedom. As my brothers and sisters both here and online are saying, Jesus, we hand this to you. Jesus, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your freedom. We thank you that you are the reason that we gather here today and will gather again in the new year. God, would you do your amazing works in this house and in our midst. In Jesus' name.